Good afternoon. Hi, good afternoon. Hello. Hello. How are you? Hello, Christiane. Hello. Hello. Hello, Semyon. Hello. Good afternoon. Hello. 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 Good to see you all. Thank nice you conference. Yes, thank yes. you very much. Thanks a lot. Yeah, thank you for joining. Very different virtually. I'm really looking forward to the time where we can meet again. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. So I just get a chat message that we're ready to start actually so um, I welcome everybody um, who's returned from the breakout room it's a great pleasure and indeed honor for me to chair this panel discussion um, we've heard a lot about the DSA package over the past two days but so far it's been largely uh, the European Commission or academic lawyers who've been analyzing the proposal. And uh, the panel discussion will give a voice to those who will have to implement maybe uh, the rules that will finally be enacted or advise those uh, that are directly affected by the rules. And we believe it is extremely important to hear these voices. And so um, I ask the audience to uh, uh, really welcome with me our distinguished panelists. Uh, who are in alphabetical order, Lucas Gottschamel uh, from Zara, and this is not the fashion brand, um, Ursula Pachl from BEUK, the European Consumer Organization, Semyon Renz from Facebook, Erika Umenberger Ziele from the Ministry for Digital and Economic Affairs, and Rania Vazir from the Vienna Data Science Group. So thank you very much to all of you for joining us for this panel discussion, uh, which has the title, the DSA and the DMA change everything to change nothing. But basically the idea is to hear from you, would you believe the DSA and DMA uh, will change for your work and what you would like to see change during the legislative procedure? And um, I would like maybe to start with, if I may, with you, Lucas. <laughs> um, you're working for ZARA, Civil Courage and Anti-Racism Initiative, which was founded, if I understand it, in 1999 with the aim of promoting civil courage and a racism-free society in Austria as well as combating all forms of racism. And since 2017, Lucas, correct me if I'm wrong, Zara has also been running the counseling center, hashtag GegenHassemNetz. So tell us more, Lucas, about your work and the role of platforms and what the current proposal of the DSA would mean for your work. Please. Thank you very much. You were absolutely correct with all the dates and, and everything. I'm, I'm, I'm very impressed. Um, thank you to all the organizers and panelists for so far putting this um, conference together and all the input we've got. I've been looking forward to yesterday and today for some time to get all this um, international um, input and different perspectives. As Christiane introduced, we were asked to present different stakeholders' perspectives. And my perspective will be from someone working in a counseling unit for people affected by online hate and people witnessing online hate online and reporting. My work consists of um, advising people and um, talking to people and thinking about options they have, um, what to do, strengthening them in, in the decision, how they want to respond to online hate they have witnessed or have been targeted personally. I also co-facilitate um, workshops on online hate and online civil courage. So it's a different um, aspect, but it's also interesting for 
uh, to have both of those um, jobs and impressions combined um, to, to, to enhance my, my understanding of, of the situation. Today, um, I, my, my, the, the, the part of my, of my professional life I, that's putting, is being put forward is the one of the counseling, uh, the person working in a counseling unit. What we've experienced or what we very often experience with people who actually are affected by online hate or who witness it is that one very strong desire and one urgent need of people is to have um, easy, fast and effective options to, to do something, to get in, back into the driver's seat, so to say. If they, they were affected, something happened to them, um, someone posted something and it's important to to be to feel in charge and have some kind of control again so that if the first um the first statements i i want to or yeah i want to use the time to emphasize on on the importance um, of easy cheap and fast access to some kind of remedy so in our line of work or in my line of work it is it is very important for affected people to, to have a good, um, good access to, to options to, to have content removed and, and tested. And in this regard, it is very important that platforms or online platforms actually do play an active moderating part. There are a, a few numbers, a few reasons of it. One is simply that the access to the judicial system is not always that easy. There are um, time constraints. Sometimes it's, it's money related. So we experience for people affected or many people who come to the counseling unit, it's of utmost important that platforms do take an active role. And in this regard, um, the DSA is, is, is very important because it um, obliges platforms to actually be active and to deal with um, complaints and notifications and it gives people a chance to, to notify illegal content. Something I, I find also very positive in the, in, the, in the draft is that it's very clear that anyone has to have a chance to notify the platform. Sometimes we experience that you have to be a registered user and that's, that's really an absurd situation. Kind of you see people, if, if you, transferred to the analogous world it could you could imagine it like having a, a glass box that's not soundproof and there are people in there screaming at each other and um, shouting um, violent content hateful content and people around are affected also but in order to do something or say something you, you need a key to get into the box and um, so that's that's very positive that anyone has to have the chance to to notify and I think it's also important because it, it shows really that that hate speech and conduct, online conduct is is not the problem of an individual being targeted, but it has a, a wider meaning and a wider importance as a society for all of us. How do we want the internet to be, or how do we want um, the discussions to work on the internet? And one, one last thing um, for now is the Article 29, I think, it's a very interesting provision, which states that um, uh, people or recipients of a service have to have the chance to, to change the algorithm. That's very interesting because it could be a step into the direction of bursting or starting to burst filter bubbles. Um, yeah, those are the, the important, yeah, those are a few important things in the DSA, which I generally regard as a, as a very positive um, proposal. Thank you. Well, thank you, Lucas, for those important insights. Um, Rania, maybe turning to you, you're a data scientist, so you're not a lawyer, which is good, <laughs> but we also have data scientists here. You're also a board member of the Vienna Data Science Group. This is also an NGO, but with a focus on knowledge sharing and networking. And I know from other projects in which we have the pleasure of collaborating together uh, that you deal a lot with the democratization of artificial intelligence and also with social media monitoring activities. 
Um, so you share with Lucas kind of the focus on fundamental rights and hate speech, but also from the perspective of freedom of information and freedom of expression, and freedom of research and potential bias in content moderation systems. So what is your view on the DSA proposal? Does it strike the right balance? So, uh, first of all, thank you very much for this um, really great conference. I, I really enjoyed listening to uh, lawyers. I, I actually don't um, normally listen to two days of lawyers talking, and it's been very uh, educational. Um, so, uh, yes, um, my, my work as a data scientist, um, especially uh, working with uh, an initiative called uh, Data for Good. Um, we, we work together with NGOs, helping them to collect data from social media to monitor, um, but in this case, not on an individual basis, but sort of to get the broad overview, a broad picture of um, how, uh, how are human rights respected online and um, uh, how do politicians, for example, conduct campaigns before um, uh, before elections. And um, so it will come as no surprise that in my role as a data scientist, uh, I'm going to ask for more data <laughs> um, and, and that I find uh, access to data uh, such a uh, fundamental um, requirement for, for even studying and understanding the systemic risks. So uh, on the one hand, um, I am thrilled that there is a DSA, that the EU is taking a step, um, and that there is uh, Article 31, which uh, calls for data access uh, for vetted researchers. Um, I'm also uh, quite happy um, with, with Article 34, which is uh, heading in the direction of standardization. Uh, and asking that uh, a, a lot of the requirements and obligations uh, should, should be pushed towards uh, standards um, so that it, it can be the same across, um, across uh, different platforms and not just a platform dependent. Um, but of course, um, I, I'm going to see lax and I'm going to see uh, things that I, I want more. And, uh, and this comes from the experience of actually trying to get data from social media. And uh, the first things that come to mind are uh, stable API access, standardized API access, um, uh, questions about uh, who negotiates with the social media platform in order for the researcher to get access. Uh, if, if you leave it to the individual researcher, you have a huge imbalance of power. Um, and uh, so um, additionally, um, the question is why only, why only academic researchers? So uh, a lot of the insights we, we've had about systemic risks um, in, in large online platforms have actually come from investigative journalists and from uh, civil society organizations. So uh, why can they not also be vetted uh, for, for access? Um, and um, the, the other thing to consider when we're talking about data access is that uh, we need this access in order to verify uh, all the transparency requirements that, that are being placed on platforms. Uh, how are we going to make sure that they're being met if we do not have uh, access to the data that will allow us to check this? Uh, how are we even going to develop uh, expertise uh, in the fields that will allow us to actually make these checks? Um, and, and how are we going to make sure that we have the infrastructure to um, study all of this? Let's not forget, this, it's, it's a lot of data. And right now, a very few 
um, or organizations have the technological power to crunch it. Um, so uh, those are things which I feel are left in, in sort of a gray area and I would like to see them clarified and a more support given to our researchers uh, who, who are supporting the verification effort. Um, and one last point um, is, is this um, sort of fundamental assumption that, that I see in the DSA that content moderation when done by algorithm uh, should be done by the platforms uh, and, and therefore is proprietary and therefore we, we require sort of transparency um, on top of these proprietary algorithms. And I would like to make um, uh, the proposal that uh, content moderation should be open and standardized uh, and, and done in an uh, open stakeholder forum where lots of the people uh, who, who are affected by this uh, get a voice and, and can uh, access the algorithms and see what they're doing. So uh, thank you very much. Well, thank you very much, Rania. I think uh, many of the suggestions you made also resonate a couple of points that were made yesterday, if I remember rightly, by Christoph Bush and others. So I think this is really a basket of, of, of good suggestions how some um, of the provisions could still be improved. Um, the two of you, Lucas and, and Rania, you, you, you were looking at the basically content uh, uh, side, so like in social media where content is posted, which may uh, qualify as hate speech or as other kind of illegal content. Um, uh, however, as we saw over the past two days, uh, the DSA has a very, very broad scope. And so it also includes uh, online marketplaces where you buy products or um, services. And um, Ursula, you are representing uh, BOIT, which is the umbrella group for 45 independent consumer organizations from 32 countries. And your daily work involves making sure the EU takes policy decisions that improve the lives of consumers. So your focus is a slightly different one from that taken by uh, both Rania and Lucas. There is certainly an overlap because consumers are um, uh, affected by content moderation. But if I understand you correctly, your focus is mostly on typical consumer rights. So for example, with regard to product safety, um, online fraud and scams, damages, contract performance, performance, behavioral advertising, and so on. So um, is it wise to um, have both in that DSA with a very broad scope? And what is your view on the Digital Services Act? So does it serve the interests of consumers or is the more needed? Yes, thank you very much, Christiane, for this introduction, and thank you very much for having having me here and and uh, being able to provide uh, also the consumer perspective. Um, as you said, I mean there are so many different topics, and the more you look into the DSA and the DMA package, uh, the 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 more complicated and complex it gets, but also the more important. So maybe just to to say at the beginning, we think that the Commission really did quite a good job here. We see the glass rather half full. Uh, there is a lot to improve still, uh, but in, in principle, I think it's, it's a positive starting point. And maybe before digging into the legalistic discussion, I thought it may be interesting to just look a little bit at what we see are the challenges and, and you touched briefly upon it, uh, Christiane. So uh, our focus was uh, indeed on online marketplaces, first of all, and the and the DSA should indeed uh, differentiate because the e-commerce directive doesn't really do that. But we see that there are at least some differentiations now in the in the proposal that the Commission uh, made. Uh, so it's about uh, the the problem that consumer associations really increasingly in the past years 
keep uncovering unsafe and illegal activities online. Um, and the second point I would briefly touch upon is um, the business model, which uh, is predominantly, I think I can say, uh, a business model that has been uh, called a surveillance capitalism uh, business model, uh, which is very problematic based on exploitation of personal data of people that are not even aware and wouldn't really like to be exploited like that. And that can also lead to discrimination, manipulation, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, not to speak about the whole issue of competition and the newly acquired term of contestability of markets that we have now in the DMA, which maybe we'll have to time to, to look into it. So on, on the safety um, uh, point, what we saw and our members test a lot of uh, products they find on platforms, just to give you one example, uh, six organizations across the European Union tested 250 products uh, and uh, that was portals like AliExpress, Amazon, eBay, and Wish. And 66% of these products were not complying with European safety standards. Uh, if we look at content, uh, we see um, also that there is a really big issue with fake reviews now. There is a massive industry that has uh, developed. And so it's easy, uh, very easy for traders to, for example, buy 100 positive reviews for really a, a very tiny amount of money. And not even that, there is even like uh, endorsements by platforms, which we know consumers trust a lot. So just to give you a test example, uh, there is Amazon um, the the Amazon um, uh, endorsement, uh, which is a good buy, and that also is up for sale uh, in this shadow industry, uh, but consumers are not aware of, of the problem. And the expectations on the other side of consumers are high. We have some surveys, for example, 93% of consumers in Germany expect that online platforms, uh, that they ensure that the traders uh, comply with the law so that what happens on the platform should be compliant and it's the job of the platform. So that's what consumers think. And only 21% of consumers in the UK, for example, uh, knew that there is no legal responsibility of the platform so to oversee the products uh, that they have on the platform. So safety of e-commerce, big topic, fraudulent traders and scams very much also increased under the COVID pandemic, when on the other hand, we know platforms making enormous amounts of profit, particularly because we're all locked down at home and dependent on, on these services. Um, but also, and I had the chance to unfortunately only shortly look at the last uh, panel, the whole issue of redress and damages and what is really the liability of these platforms when things go wrong, that is just not clear and there is a real need to improve that. And I, I hope I can come back to that in a second, but I have to say that we were very much inspired also by the uh, European Law Institute model rules. And it's a pleasure to say that in a panel where Christiane is, is, is the chair. So th there are certainly some good ideas that could be um, proposed here to further improve. And last but not least, as I said, advertising and particularly profiling of consumers. We think that there is a need to strengthen the rules, particularly also when it comes to children and how they are uh, protected from uh, commercialization. So maybe for a first round, before going into the proposals on, on the various uh, elements that I said, uh, I, I stop here and hope to come back then. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, Ursula. So that was a plea for more liability. Not sure the next <laughs> speaker whom I'm going to call upon will agree with that. But maybe to uh, remind the audience that um, we are going to have a first round here on the panel. But of course, we're going to open up the discussion. So if you have any uh, questions uh, already now, or would you like to make any statements and engage in that discussion, please prepare your questions already now. Um, as always, you have two options. You can type them into the Q&A function and I will read them then, um, or you can raise your hand and, and, and I will then uh, unmute your mic. But um, be before we, we open up the discussion, let me, let me uh, come to uh, our next panelist, uh, Semyon Renz. Um, 
uh, Semyon Rents is from Facebook, which is a company um, I probably don't have to introduce to you. And we don't have to count staff or turnover. I, I guess it doesn't qualify as micro, small or medium sized. I guess it's one of the uh, players that is uh, basically uh, 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 within the whole scope um, and to which all of this would apply. So Semyon, uh, we've now heard a lot about um, basically also a user perspective. So it's, it's, it's high time we, we, we turn to the perspective of platform operators and you're um, representing a really, really big uh, platform, Facebook. So um, you're among the biggest players globally, and uh, you certainly uh, have a lot of comments on the package we now see on the table. Um, in what way do you think it will affect your future work? And what is your view on what has been proposed by the European Commission? Yeah, thank you very much again for having me and good afternoon again. Um, yeah, I can assure you we are in scope. Uh, I think that's uh, <laughs> absolutely clear. Um, but let me maybe start by saying um, uh, the DSA and the DMA, they are very different in nature, uh, the types of regulation, and uh, they try to, diff uh, to solve different uh, issues. So I think it's important to distinguish a bit. Um, but in general, I can say, and that might surprise some, uh, I can imagine we welcome both uh, dossiers. Um, we especially welcome that the European Commission has taken an approach to harmonize rules across Europe, um, which is really utmost important for, for us, but also many smaller platforms uh, in Europe, because we have seen over the past years um, a continued fragmentation of the digital single market, different rules, different regulatory authorities, partly contradicting rules. Uh, I mean, just uh, to give you one example, uh, just in Germany um, at the end of this year, once certain laws will be passed, we have at least uh, five regulatory authorities which are uh, overseeing different parts of our platform. Um, and uh, this is why it's so important to have harmonized rules uh, in Europe, also for users, because we are speaking ab about a global internet and global platforms. Um, and in addition, um, we have been calling for regulation for quite some years, and now we have the proposals on the table. Uh, so our main objective is really to become compliant um, and to inform uh, the legislative debate, which is now to kick off and constructively engage uh, the stakeholders. Um, as, as some already pointed out, the, the DMA and DSA, they are both quite complex, uh, very nuanced regulations. Um, I also want to stress, they are definitely burdensome. They will change uh, the way how uh, digital platforms will operate. Um, in general, uh, we think as said that this is uh, necessary, that we need new rules uh, for the digital um, ecosystem, the internet and digital platforms. But we are right now at the very beginning of analyzing the very details. So I would like to give you just um, an initial uh, overview of our current thinking and also where we are coming from, especially with regard to the DSA. <clears throat> and maybe just to start with the DSA, um, um, I think that from a Facebook perspective, we were over the past years and are still at the, really the forefront of the most challenging uh, and difficult questions society is facing today. And we believe that we should not uh, find the solutions our, uh, on our own. And most importantly, we should not set the rules uh, on our own, but it needs clear rules from legislators, elected officials uh, and democracies. Um, this is why this is so important. Um, I am with Facebook now for five years and I can assure you a lot has changed over the past five years. The company has massively invested in combating especially um, harmful and illegal content. That doesn't mean that there's not still room to improve things. That's definitely the case. Uh, but there has changed a lot. Um, and it led to a, a little different situation or different debate. Um, so in the past, we have discussed that uh, social media platforms should do more. I think that is partly accomplished. As said, not everything is accomplished yet, and there's uh, more things to do. But it led to a discussion of, uh, um, on whether digital platforms such as Facebook 
should make all of these decisions on their own. And I think the most prominent and recent case is uh, the decision uh, to abandon uh, the Facebook account of Donald Trump, um, which was controversial. Um, and some people, depending on the political spectrum, said it was a wrong decision. Others said it was the right decision. And uh, that puts us always with such critical decisions in a very, very difficult um, position because we will get criticized from either side. Um, and this is why we want clarity um, and clear sets of rules, uh, which help us to become compliant and, um, no, um, and have got clear guidance. Um, in the meantime, as we don't have these rules yet, we have set up in 2020 the Independent Oversight Board, some of you might have heard of, which is a board uh, which consists of experts, fundamental rights experts, former Nobel Prize uh, winners in the area of fundamental rights and so on. And we have now forwarded, for example, the Trump decision to this uh, oversight board to ask for their feedback. And this will be a binding decision within the first half of 2021 um, by this board on whether the decision itself was right. And they will also give us guidance on how to further develop um, our community standards in light of this decision. So, but this is obviously just the first step. Uh, and what we really hope, um, and that's where I come back to the DSA, is that we will get uh, more certainty, more guidance uh, from a regulatory framework on what is our role as a social media platform, uh, what is the role of the legislature, of independent courts, um, of the police, uh, et cetera to have really legal certainty when we take such decisions. And this is why we really welcome um, uh, the DSA. And in general, uh, just to raise um, uh, a few uh, more particular points, uh, we welcome that the DSA is based on the principles of transparency, accountability, uh, and of course also oversight. Uh, we ha still have some questions with regard how the digital service coordinator and this oversight model will work in practice. Um, but in general, uh, we believe that this is the right approach. Um, and also that important pillars from the e-commerce directive are maintained, uh, such as limited liability for hosting services and a general prohibition uh, 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 for the obligation to monitor, which is also quite important to give the right incentives to platforms uh, to take the right steps. And uh, last but not least also, a clear distinction between what is illegal content and what is harmful content. And we know that talk, the harmful content can be very toxic. Um, it can cause harm, but it's still nevertheless something different from illegal content. And I think uh, the, the DSA takes the right approach in distinguishing between the two. And as I know, I'm running out of time just very briefly uh, on the DMA, which is uh, also quite relevant, of course, for us. Um, as said, the nature of the DMA is very different. It tries to solve a different uh, problem and uh, especially how competition uh, in the digital age has changed with regard to digital platforms. We acknowledge that. Um, we actually right now have a lot of questions, especially on the DMA and how it will work in practice. Because again, our main objective is compliance um, with, the, uh, with the law. And the DMA in particular sets forth 18 different rules, which will apply ex ante, uh, self-executing rules. And there's no or almost no uh, possibility for digital platforms to clarify on whether we are compliant or not. And also these 18 rules apply irrespectively of the service. So for us, for example, also um, the rules for app stores would apply although we don't know how uh, to implement these rules because we are not running an app store. Um, so th this shows why such a one-size-fits-all model is, a, is problematic. Um, and from our point of view, it will cause negative side effects for innovation, uh, for co even for competition uh, in, in Europe, if we have such a one-size-fits-all model. Uh, and it will also not be in the favor uh, of consumers. Um, and... Uh, last but not least, uh, this is why we believe that especially Article 5 and Article 6 in the DMA need to be amended in a way that there is a process to get into a dialogue with the European Commission in order to A, justify certain behavior, which might be pro-competitive, um, and B, also uh, to clarify on whether the steps we have taken are actually uh, sufficient to become compliant uh, with the rule of law. 
And maybe I'll stop here um, and looking forward to the discussion. Well, thank you so much, Samyon. So uh, by and large, uh, I got the message Facebook is pretty happy with the DSA, but not so happy with the DMA proposal as it currently stands. Uh, I think you touched upon a lot of very important points, which I'm sure we will come to later in the discussion. But maybe before we open up the floor and have maybe a second round, um, among the panelists, I would like to turn to uh, Erica. Um, so we've heard now some wish lists from from stakeholders, <laughs> and um, uh, the 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 last wish list was one about the the DMA, which which came from 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 Facebook, and of course the wish list is now addressed to those who will be negotiating the whole package in Brussels and other places over the coming months and possibly over the coming years. And you are one of the persons, Erika, um, in charge of those negotiations at European level as you represent Austria in the working party competition concerning the DMA. And you're also in close contact, if I understand you correctly, with the Ministry of Justice uh, concerning the negotiations of the DSA in the working party of the internal market. So what are your expectations? Do you anticipate very difficult negotiations, very lengthy negotiations? Um, do you expect that there will be fundamental changes? Um, so uh, what is your view of what the next months or years uh, will be like for, for your work when it comes to the DSA package? Uh, first of all, well, many thanks for inviting me and also for organizing this really, really deep diving uh, conference, which is uh, at the right moment at this stage of uh, stage of discussions of those big dossiers. Um, as you said, um, we are very ha also happy that the Commission presented this uh, uh, last December. Uh, Austria was calling for uh, European legislation. Uh, we started also national legislation. Uh, and so we are kind of a driver on, on this. Uh, and coming back to your question of this panel, if we uh, change everything to change nothing, I think uh, we cannot afford to change nothing. So our duty in a working party is to make it work. Uh, and uh, uh, there are some points I will uh, pick up later uh, concerning the timetable in the next months. Uh, we are at the beginning in the working party uh, it's a, a situation where you can ask questions and uh, and analyze the understanding um, and uh, at that moment uh, the positions are not so clear now because uh, it's uh, the time was too short we are finding national uh, positions at that moment we invited uh, stakeholders uh, and so we expect uh, at least one and a half years of negotiations in, in the working party. This is uh, uh, our experience with dossiers. Uh, and uh, at that point, I think it's uh, also not a, a secret that Fran France announced that they have the aim to finish the, uh, the negotiations during their um, a presidency, which is in the first half of the year 2022. Um, at the same time, uh, the European Parliament tries to find some positions. Uh, there are also big discussions and the interest is very big. Um, and so we hope uh, and the expectations is that we find some improvements uh, on, on the dossier. Uh, so I think there will be discussions on how we can improve the enforcement. This is also a big uh, issue for us. Um, and coming back to the uh, DMA um, uh, wishes of, uh, of you, uh, Simon. Um, well, I think it was the problem uh, that the enforcement so far under the competi competition law uh, regime was kind of uh, a sticky process. And I think it's uh, necessary and the aim of the DMA to find some clarifications and clear uh, uh, do's and don'ts. Uh, I think that was the whole aim of the DMA. And coming back to Article 5 and 6, um, well, it's, it's called ex-ante regulation, 
um, and there are some um, possibilities uh, for, for applying for exemptions. So I think there is some room to, to find uh, uh, the perfect uh, solution. But I think the improvement at least should be that we have a very quick procedure finding a gatekeeper. There, I think there are some, it was not uh, so far uh, brought up in the discussions yesterday that there is a gatekeeper designation process. And um, I, I, we hope that this process is not too long uh, because if we um, look at the timetable, uh, as I said, if we have a decision on the uh, proposal in 2022, uh, it will come into force in 2023. And then you have a long gatekeeper process, then we are counting the year 20, 2024 and uh, uh, that's quite a long time and at the same time I look to the United States where we have big discussions on regulations uh, last Friday there was a hearing in the in the Congress and um, uh, I think that it seems quite sure that there will uh, some, be some regulations there also and uh, I think in Europe we should not look too uh, boring uh, on, on what we are producing. So first point is for us that we need to have a solution which brings swift and effective enforcement. Um, and at the same time, uh, coming, bringing up the, the proposals of the other panel members, uh, of course, it's very difficult to find the right balance between uh, uh, what is legal, what is not uh, uh, legal. And, and it's a, a big duty for the, for the providers to decide this. And um, the more responsibility we, we overload, I think that would have uh, on the other side, the problem of the overblocking. I think this would be also a, would be a big discussion. We need to have really a regime which uh, uh, brings also swift uh, um, complaint handling systems. This is a, a, a very important for uh, ensuring the freedom of speech. But also uh, in the business sector, we hear a lot of complaints that uh, businesses were blocked for some kind of reason who nobody understands, but it's very uh, damaging for their business. Uh, so I think we need some improvements there, as we know that the regime which was offered in the platform to business regulation um, is not working. We have a lot of complaints from businesses that those, this uh, complaint uh, uh, mechanism does not work. So we need some improvements there also. Um, and one topic was not uh, brought up in the discussions was also the uh, topic of killer mergers. There is Article 12 in, in the DMA, which foresees a notice system. But for us, it's not clear yet uh, what the notice system brings because there is no change in the merger control um, uh, regulation. So I think this will be a discussion. Um, uh, I think it's all the world, the discussion concerning killer mergers, conglomerate mergers, and so on. And one point which was, I think, uh, brought up by a lot of um, uh, discussion uh, uh, speakers is the interplay with all the different uh, law, uh, laws, existing laws at European level, national levels, levels, and also the different responsibilities of different authorities and the interplay between them. I think this will be a very, uh, on the one hand, technical uh, issue, but we need to have really clarifications in order to ensure um, effective enforcement. That is uh, from, from, from my side, the first uh, contribution. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, Erica. That was really a host of very important aspects. And, and let me remind the audience uh, before we have our second round that uh, you can type uh, questions or statements, comments into the Q&A, or you can uh, raise your hand and I will then unmute your mic. But before we come to the Q&A, uh, let me pick up on something which uh, Semyon mentioned, and I think it's a case uh, we all know and uh, we all have our own opinion about, and, and this is the, the, the blocking or even delisting of the former president of the United States, Donald Trump, from various platforms. 
Now, um, Semyon, you, you, you explained how difficult that case was for you and that you're also um, waiting for more guidance, uh, which you will receive from the board. Um, maybe you could explain in a couple of uh, um, comments um, in what way do you believe um, uh, this situation uh, or you would have more guidance, let's put it like that, would you have more guidance under the DSA? Would that somehow facilitate the situation for um, platforms or uh, rather not? And then maybe we can open up the discussion because I'm sure um, um, also the other panelists have a view on that case. But maybe Semyon, you can you could uh, uh, start. Yeah. Well, it's a difficult one. Um, I mean, the, the situation uh, when we decided uh, also as other uh, uh, platforms like Twitter uh, and Google uh, to block uh, the account of former President uh, Trump um, was that there was a lot of incitement uh, to hatred, uh, to, to action, to actual violence um, in a very tricky situation, which is uh, potentially also hard to imagine for us Europeans uh, in a, any way polarized uh, uh, context in the United States. Um, and in that concrete uh, situation, we, we took that decision based on our community standards uh, to first block um, or suspend the account uh, of Donald Trump because we saw um, an imminent threat for uh, offline violence. I think that was obvious. But it was a tough decision um, for the people in our company who are taking such decisions. And that is exactly why we created uh, the oversight board, because um, on the one hand, we are a private company. Um, with, and I think it's absolutely legitimate that we have our own host, rule, host rules. And that is also important because we serve a um, um, uh, special um, um, type of users and that can vary from platform to platform and therefore the, the house rules vary from platform to platform. But on the other hand, of course, um, uh, our platform is giving uh, global reach for policymakers uh, or for people in general who want to raise their voice, uh, freedom of expression. Um, uh, but that needs to be balanced uh, with uh, interest in keeping our community online safe and also offline, of course. And that is the context and the balanced decision um, we needed to take at that point. I don't want to compare that to, to courts, but the process in a way is, of course, quite similar. We are balancing different interests uh, and uh, are interpreting our own rules, which are... Uh, um, uh, rather similar to European values. As you know, in the United States, you, I'm exaggerating, but you can basically say anything you want um, because it's freedom of expression. So our house rules are in a way closer to European values than to American values uh, or fundamental rights. But that was the, the difficult decision. And um, the question, the basic question is, should we alone take such decisions? Or should uh, legislators come up with principles uh, which could guide us um, in taking such, such decisions? Um, and that was, would be, of course, um, very valuable for us. I think this is not yet uh, fully anticipated in the DSA. And maybe it's also something too big to ask for, um, because I know, of course, um, imagine such a situation in Europe. Who should take such a decision? Uh, the immediate response would be courts. But will courts be uh, fast enough um, to take such a decision uh, in such a short period of time? And, and that is why it's so complicated. There is no easy answer. Uh, but I think what could be achieved at least is um, to give us and other platforms guidance based on certain principles um, in the DSA. Sorry, it was a long answer. No, I think that was very helpful, Semyon. So basically, you would uh, be looking for a little bit more guidance in the area of Article 12 uh, DSA. Is that, is that correct? Did I understand you correctly? Where well, we now have, of course, that reference to human rights and so on, but um, not really very concrete guidance. Did I yeah. understand you correctly? Yeah, I mean, that is one example um, you were just mentioning um, in the DSA, which is, of course, already something which is giving guidance, which is helpful and something we can look into. 
uh, as a legal basis and a reference point uh, for such decisions. Uh, but that is exactly, of course, what we are um, kind of looking for, yeah. Mm. So thanks a lot. So I would maybe like to pass the question on to, to Rania and then also to Lucas. Um, it, it, it's, of course, a very uh, a power, a lot of power is vested in those platforms. I mean, those platforms are now the new digital public space. So in previous times, you know, we were talking about the freedom to walk up um, on Town Hill, uh, Town Hall Square and hold up a sign and uh, uh, say uh, uh, what your opinion is on some current developments. And now that kind of public space is suddenly um, platforms held by uh, private companies. And of course, if those private companies uh, can enforce the house rules and uh, uh, take a decision who is, you know, in the future allowed to uh, have an account and to uh, reach the world or not reach the world, that is something uh, which is very important for democracy and, and also for human rights. So, Rania, do you think the, the DSA proposal um, has struck the right balance there? What is your idea of, uh, you know, how democracy and uh, freedom to express yourself and how to have equal access to um, communication uh, should be balanced? Thank you for that um, question. Uh, um, this is actually a, a question we debate a lot in, in, in the um, data science community um, uh, because first and foremost, we, we're actually very much for freedom of speech. So we want people to be allowed to say um, almost <laughs> whatever they want. Um, but uh, we do run into this uh, very awkward situation where um, a lot of what would be considered public is now happening on private platforms under private rules. And, um, and as we've learned um, in, in a private uh, context, a lot of the uh, obligations to respect fundamental rights are are not the same, are, are not uh, protected. Um, and, and so if you ask the technical community, um, we want to solve this in a technical way uh, by saying, um, well, uh, nobody says that uh, private platforms have to be the way to go. Um, you could create public platforms, you could create uh, interoperability requirements, um, and, and you could create, um, as, as I mentioned before, and also uh, uh, yesterday, several uh, speakers mentioned before, you could also uh, create um, uh, content moderation and even content uh, curation. So uh, recommender systems, which are open and transparent um, and, and therefore sort of sidestep the whole question, um, should a private platform be expected to uh, guarantee all of these rights? Um, so I guess my answer would be, I don't really expect this from a private platform. I think, um, I think this does bring up a lot of uh, um, unpleasant issues uh, and and uh, my preference would be a public space should be public and run in an open and um, open source way. Okay, thanks a lot. I, I announced I would call on, on Lucas, but this is now too tempting to, to uh, uh, ask Semyon about his, his view on that. Uh, Semyon, is that something um, you would believe um, is, is desirable? Would, would Facebook be um, prepared to follow that uh, a suggestion and to become a more of a public space? <laughs> Uh, I, I mean, uh, um, I'm kidding now a bit, but we once had a meeting with Mr. Sonneborn uh, from uh, the German satire party who said, 
when they are in charge, we will become a public entity. Um, um, but uh, yeah, I don't think that this is the answer. I mean, uh, of course, it's totally up to, to public entities to develop um, um, social networks. Um, but I, I don't think that this is uh, uh, the answer for now and for, for our concrete situation. Um, um, yeah. Uh, I guess it's uh, that is difficult. Um, I mean, it's, it's as said by Rania, it's it's rather a sidestep. It's not like a concrete answer, and even that, I mean, uh, would lead to similar questions. And this is very theoretical and philosophical in a way, because giving, on the other hand, nation states uh, so much power raises other questions, other fundamental rights questions, of course. Um, but uh, we are not there, um, so uh, this is rather a theoretical question. Um, yeah. <laughs> but if I may say just um, what I think which is important, what Rania raised is definitely transparency, accountability, uh, the community standards need to be transparent, um, um, they need to be accountable, um, uh, they need to be based on, on uh, values we all share, uh, I think that is absolutely clear. Mm. Well, thank you so much. But now I have to keep my promise and, and ask Lucas. Lucas, what is your view on the Trump case? And um, does the DSA help in the Trump case and in similar cases that might uh, come up? Thank you very much. I also thought it was too tempting not to ask uh, Samuel for an immediate response. So um, I'm perfectly fine. Um, yeah, I agree, obviously, that the, the power of private companies um, with regard to who gets a voice or who does not get a voice um, does pose a lot of difficult questions and, and many factors to be taken into account. Like, does a president use an official account or does he use a private account? And also the right of information of users if it's the only way to access information uh, the president offers. Um, with regard to, to your question, if the DSA helps, I. I guess it's important to have the, the, the two aspects in mind, the illegal content and the harmful content. For the illegal content, I, I think it, it gives a good guideline. Anything that is illegal <laughs> has to be taken down. If you don't do it, you, you're liable. I think that's, I mean, knowing that it's not so easy always to tell what, what is illegal and what is not illegal, but in principle, um, the rule I think is, is, is helpful in this area, in the area of the harmful content, I think you, you, you mentioned Article 12, um, Christiane, I think that's, the, that's the, the key issue in this, to this question, does the European Union um, find a way into the terms of conditions? I don't see it at the moment um, in the DSA to set a kind of a minimum and maybe a maximum standard. Is it possible to, to, to find a way to, to regulate, okay, a platform, a very large um, online platform with this power has to allow certain kinds of, um, of content and certain kind of content, maybe even below the illegal content, because that's clear already, um, has to be removed, even though it's not illegal. So I think the, the regarding the harmful content, I don't, I don't yet see how, how the DSA um, helps to to find uh, to find the, the solution. Mm -hmm. Now, um, thank you very much indeed, uh, Ursula. Please. Yes, I just wanted to add, if I may, and absolutely not on the specific Trump case, and it's not an area that we are particularly looking at in terms of harmful content in this respect. But I wanted to raise one element, which I touched upon in the beginning, which is that there is an important element, which is uh, generally overlooked a little bit, which is the business model. Uh, speaking about clickbaiting, so this harmful content uh, is spread around because of a specific business model that relies on as many clicks as you get, as more money you get. Uh, and it's obvious that the content that is somehow outrageous or is somehow emotionally interesting is the one that gets uh, the clicks. And so we have since many years said that should be closer looked at how the business model functions in that um, respect. So what I wanted to say is platforms have a big responsibility in terms of 
how the content spreads around in relation to how they put recommender systems in place, what content is recommended, how the content is organized, uh, how the profiles are sold and shared, if I may put it nicely, with third parties who then reuse that content to advertise on the platforms. So I think we should not overlook that aspect when it comes to how harmful content is spread around and what responsibility platforms should have in that respect. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ursula. I think that was an extremely important point you made about the business model, because that is also something we see in the context of data protection, where sometimes, you know, the kind of information which you find in Articles 13 and 14 of the GDPR, yes, it's, it's all important, but sometimes what uh, users would be really interested in is what is the business model? You know, um, if I don't pay for the service, I'm most likely the product. So, but in what way uh, uh, am I the product, and what really uh, is 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 the business model behind it? So, I think that's that's really a very important point, and that business model, of course, it's it's a very sensitive area because that touches upon trade secrets and 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 all the rest of it, and and one has to be very cautious in regulating in that area. But nevertheless, I think it's a very important uh, point to bear in mind. I see I have uh, one question or several questions in the chat. I don't know why people are using both the chat and the Q&A, but in any way, I, I will look at both. So um, I see a question in the Q&A, and this is uh, from Yannick Duller. And it's a question again to Semyon. Um, uh, and the question is, do you fear that different house rules of different platforms would facilitate information bubbles as similar minded people get together on platforms with which they can identify? And, and of course, we all think about Parler. Um, and if yes, wouldn't we need more than mere guidance for house rules? Semyon, there was a question addressed to you. I think it's less a question or a problem with the house rules itself, because I mean, different platforms are, as I said, serving different types of users. For example, a dating platform uh, needs different house rules than comparison to, for example, Facebook, Instagram, or uh, I don't know, a platform which is, for, for example, especially serving younger users. So you need different house rules there. So I think that is not, not the, it makes sense that there are different house rules and different standards depending on, uh, on the concrete case. I mean, that ob observation with Pala, for example, but also with Telegram is of course uh, something um, which is called deplatforming. Uh, I mean, as especially uh, the bigger platforms are taking really uh, a lot of steps to fight uh, and combat harmful content and uh, users which are abusing our platform. There is this movement to other platforms. We saw that in the past with, um, uh, um, I forgot the name of uh, Foul Contact, a Russian um, social media platform, which already exists for quite a while. Uh, we now saw that with Telegram in the context of the COVID discussion, and also of course in the US with Parler. So we will see this more often. Um, uh, these kind of deplatforming uh, developments, uh, but I wouldn't say that this is uh, related uh, purely to the house rules or that there's not one set of rules. I mean, of course, it's an issue that these other platforms are not enforcing um, uh, against harmful content and that partly these platforms are creating a business model around uh, um, hatred content uh, and that is of course in general um, a concerning development but for us it's um, good on the one hand because then we don't have uh, those people on Facebook on other main social media platforms um, spreading toxic content there um, and there are different uh, I think res uh, research papers currently in the making uh, by different scientists looking into the broader picture, whether this is wishful, whether this is problematic, especially from a law enforcement point of view, as law enforcement will uh, have more and more problems in, uh, in um, enforcing um, against these uh, people who are using for uh, especially platforms like Telegram. 
Thanks a lot, Semyon, for answering that question. I now have uh, a list of comments in the chat. I do apologize, I can't read all of them. Some of them seem to be encrypted or whatever. I see some comments that the point about reaction time to deplatform is very uh, uh, interesting and important because it took years uh, of abuse by Trump to um, uh, have him delisted uh, and, and also loss of life. Um, I, I would kindly ask maybe uh, 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 the audience to rather use the Q&A function because that seems to be more reliable and then I can also uh, maybe read out uh, the questions to the panelists. But maybe turning to Erica, we now heard a lot of um, uh, uh, discussions about, you know, the, the rather the harmful content part and, and, and that possibly um, um, in the area of Article 12, more, more guidance or additional regulation uh, could be provided, even though this is certainly not a view shared by everyone, but um, it's, it's something that we, we hear very often. How realistic do you think uh, would that be in the legislative process? Or is it simply an area that is too difficult to touch upon, to, to regulate, also too sensitive? Well, I, I do expect, of course, uh, discussions on this. Um, if we compare to uh, our national law um, on the communication platforms, we had uh, a, a clearer rule, yes. Um, and I think, well, at European level, it is necessary to have a discussion because, as I said now, if you have such a wide uh, uh, description, uh, then um, you give more risk, uh, you risk uh, overblocking much more. So I think this this will be... Uh, the, it's necessary to discuss this. Well, however, I don't have the solution yet. <laughs> Thank you very much, uh, Erica. Um, let me maybe turn to another highly contested point, and it's a point raised by Ursula, which is also something, of course, many panelists today during the sessions uh, were addressing, which is uh, the, the liability gap. Uh, so we have shields from liability, um, but we do not have a basis for liability in the whole regulation. It's even uh, unclear to what uh, extent those shields from liability would also shield platform providers from very traditional um, types of liability and um, including for unsafe products and so on. And um, it's, it's striking that there is no link as Christoph Bush also explained yesterday uh, between the various chapters. So it's, it, there's public enforcement when you um, uh, violate some of the uh, provisions under the regulation, but it's not clear how that translates. And also uh, uh, Hans Schulte-Nölk and others uh, uh, address this today, how that translates into potential private enforcement, or would then public enforcement include possibly compensation? So um, this liability gap is something uh, which uh, we, 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 we see in this uh, regulation. And of course, there are also good reasons for having this liability gap, but it's also something that uh, could be dangerous and, and, and mean that enforcement isn't as effective as we would like it to be. Um, maybe, um, Ursula, you could um, uh, explain a little bit more what your ideas would be from the uh, point of view of and then maybe, of course, we might uh, wish to uh, ask also a representative of the platform economy what they uh, what their view is on on liability. So, Ursula. Yes, thank you very much indeed, Christiane. I mean, this is a really big point for us because uh, the e-commerce directive, though we in principle support, the, of course, the, the, the fact that hosting platforms should not be liable per principle uh, for the content they host, because of these developments that I uh, described, and particularly now I'm talking about online marketplaces, because they really basically open the door 
to European consumers uh, for many traders who really bring products that do just simply not comply and nobody cares about that and the platforms are not ready to take any responsibility for uh, these developments, but they make huge profits. We have asked uh, for a positive liability that should be established in the DSA um, for certain situations. So first of all, the situation is not clear with regards to the obligations in the DSA when they are not met. So if the platform does not act expediently, despite the fact that there has been um, notice, and, and we would like to follow also what the European Law Institute has proposed in terms of when there is convincing evidence that there is illegal activity, then uh, the, the platform uh, should be liable for damages potentially also for uh, contract performance if, if there is a problem. Uh, but also under specific circumstances, um, for example, a clarification with regards to the exemption where there is a platform that has control over the trader, what does it mean in predominant uh, business models where it's the platform in reality who decides upon everything. You could think about Uber uh, as an example. There we would like to see um, a liability, a direct liability for damages uh, for uh, the platform. And the commission has introduced something for online marketplaces, which is this famous Article 5, Paragraph 3, but it's a very narrow concept and it seems to be reduced to a situation where there is confusion or where there is a, a perception confusion by the consumer about who he or she is entering into transaction with. So if the consumers uh, and it's the average uh, consumer uh, model that has been developed in the European Court of Justice case law uh, that, that is reasonably informed, etc. cetera, that, that could have the impression if the platform, uh, then the platform could be held liable for uh, consumer law infringements. And we don't even know what is that consumer law, what is included, like you said, product liability, does that count? And how would that uh, relate to it? But there is even a bigger problem. I haven't heard that um, uh, being raised so far, but there is uh, this recital 17, which seems to say that it's only the DSA that stipulates exemptions to liability. And there is no other law that can uh, stipulate uh, these ex uh, can have exemptions or can establish positive liability in the circumstances of hosting services. That's how I read it. And we find that that is very problematic. Like uh, you mentioned the GDPR, um, of course, there is also under certain circumstances of infringement, there is liability uh, for the controller or the processor under the GDPR. But that is not clear how this would relate uh, to this um, specific um, um, recital it is uh, in the DSA. So this interplay between, for example, the product liability legislation, and we hope that in a reviewed uh, product liability directive, there would also be responsibility of the platform in certain circumstances, how this would relate, uh, uh, that, that is entirely unclear. So there is quite a bit to look into in this respect. Thank you. Well, thanks a lot, Ursula. Now, I realize Facebook is not exactly an, an online marketplace, so you may not be the ideal interlocutor, Samian, for that uh, uh, um, issue. But nevertheless, I'm, I'm sure you have a view about um, liability, because in fact, liability is not just something for online marketplaces. Liability could also... Uh, be 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 there for um, other infringements, which would apply um, also to Facebook. Uh, Semyon, um, what is your view on the liability gap? Yeah, well, um, I mean, this is a perfect example of why it makes sense to look at the concrete platform. Um, marketplaces are obviously different from a social network where often uh, freedom of speech um, is involved as a fundamental right. Um, and if we should, um, I mean, the, the limited liability system, especially in the e-commerce directive and importantly for social media platforms, it reflects the nature um, of our services. It, it wouldn't be possible technically um, to, to monitor and check 
every content which is posted on our platform. Um, so uh, and it would be also not wishful, I would say, if we would start checking that uh, because, uh, I mean, it's, it's, it's something uh, related to, to lawyers which would need to look into that, whether every single piece of content is uh, lawful. Um, and I, I just can't imagine that scenario because it would have huge impact on freedom of expression, I think it's a bit related to what we are currently discussing uh, in the con context of copyright, upload filters, uh, and, and stuff like that. Although that is obviously a bit different um, um, in the copyright discussion. But this is why, in general, it's so important to have uh, this system as it is in place right now. Um, uh, with the e-commerce directive, although also having said this, uh, it is right that the DSA is giving incentives to the platforms to do more to fight harmful content, which is not necessarily illegal. Uh, but this is again then based on, on uh, the community standards, the house rules, and therefore, of course, a different uh, sets of rules um, applies. But um, um, obviously, we will be, once we are notified by the user um, or a third-party stakeholder, a trust flagger, we are on notice. Uh, and then, of course, the liability re regime also in the DSA will start to kick off, um, which obviously makes sense. Mm -hmm. now, thanks a lot. I mean, I mean, absence of an obligation to monitor is, of course, one thing. And the other thing is liability for proven violation of the duties under the DSA. I think we have to keep those two um, aspects apart. So I think there are certainly good reasons for not having a general monitoring obligation, in particular when it comes to, 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 to speech. But um, then when uh, the duties are violated, uh, this may be a different uh, question. Uh, I, I'd like to turn to Lucas, in fact, because he is uh, confronted every day with people who are affected actually by uh, illegal content and, uh, and and harmful content because illegal content is usually also harmful and um, so um, would you believe that we we need stronger liability rules I think the taking into account the importance of freedom of speech and um, the ability to, to, to run the business. Um, it's, it's, it's okay that there's no, no liability and no general um, um, detection um, obligation. What is necessary, I think, is that, that, the, that the, notice, the notice mechanisms, they are implemented in a way that they're fast and that people get a clear and a good response and that it's um, transparent why this decision um, is taken this way or that way. And in this, this regard, um, something I, I would like to add to the wish list <laughs> uh, for, the, for this proposal, if I understand it correctly, and um, I like to stand corrected if, if, I, if I read it incorrectly, is that under Article 17, that's the internal complaint handling mechanism, it, I read it in a way that it's only open um, to people who had um, their content taken down and that there's no internal complaint mechanism if a platform decides not to be active. I think that that's, um, I, I don't understand exactly why the proposal um, leans this way. And, and another thing I find crucial or uh, yeah, of crucial importance is that I also understand Article 17 in a way that the, the original notifier does not get an information if the originally taken down content is uploaded again because the decision is reversed after the internal complaint mechanism. And if, if I understand stand Article 7 correctly in this respect, I think it's, it's very important that this information link has to be established by the platform because it's absolutely of Im imminent importance to, to know if a takedown decision has been um, rewound, uh, uh, has been reversed and revoked. Um, yeah, and I'm, I'm very interested in, in this aspect. And regarding the, the liability or the fear of liability and the overblocking um, issue, I would, if, if there's time, be very interested in, in your, your idea and your take on, 
on, on, on the following question. Very often it's, it's argued that the fear of liability leads to overblocking. And I, I, I would like to ask the question, um, is there a fear of liability because of overblocking? Because we, we know that people who had content removed um, without, um, without cause can actually also sue platforms to have the content uploaded again. So I see there, there are two, two possible liabilities. And I, one is very, very strong in, in the discussion. And I, I would be interested in, in your, your remarks about fear of liability because of overblocking. Um, Thank you very much, Lucas. I think that's a very important point. I, I understood you as, as addressing the question to the whole panel. Is that Yes, 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 whoever yeah. is. Uh, <laughs> so sorry who, who for, to, for taking over your spot. To, to pick up on that. Liability because of overblock and yeah, because of, of you take down content, you um, possibly infringe rights. Yeah, Rania, please. Um, I, I'm going to take a, a, a step back um, just, just to mention that um, there is a little bit of research about uh, the content that gets taken down automatically by algorithms. And um, the research indicates that it's uh, disadvantaged minorities that are uh, most, effect most affected by uh, wrongful takedowns. And um, again, a little bit of research indicates that disadvantaged minorities are the ones who are least likely uh, to, to go for legal recourse. Uh, and therefore, <laughs> if you follow this line of thought, um, overblocking uh, is least likely to lead to um, legal action. So uh, just, just from the uh, algorithm point of view. Okay, thank you. Ursula. I'm sorry, I have to use this to say, I mean, from a consumer perspective, the issues that I described, we have the contrary problem that because it, it is that there is no blocking of whatever product uh, is coming into the platform. And we know it that even when consumer organizations go to the online marketplaces, and again, this is why it's specific be necessary to have specific rules for online marketplaces that nothing happens. So repeatedly things have been pointed out to platforms to say, look, this is dangerous, this is not compliant and nothing happens. This can happen when consumer organizations do it. But if you're an individual consumer and you complain, you will not have answers. Uh, that is the normal situation. And this is when I come back to the liability. We have done a lot of tests and it can, you can, as a, as a trader, in a, in a very short time, you can have an account on the big platforms with showing no legitimation whatsoever. And this is why it's so important to have this know your business principle in the DSA. We have it now. It's not so badly done. But what is missing is, again, the link, because if you do not... Uh, ensure that everybody who has an account as a trader on your platform is legitimately a trader, then there is no consequence. So there is no liability established. So this is really something, again, where we need to be clear about what are um, the consequences of such non-respect uh, of obligations in the DSA. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. Colleagues, I realize we're running out of time, so I'm afraid we will not be able to address all the questions uh, in the in the Q&A. So what I would like to do is ask one last question to, to Erica and then maybe to give the other panelists an, an, uh, uh, an opportunity to add one key point, one key takeaway uh, for Erica to <laughs> um, you know, carry into the negotiations over the coming years. Erica, the, the question I would like to ask to you is, um, we've now heard that divide. Um, so we've heard the, the online marketplaces and consumer law sphere, so to say, uh, where we, 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 we hear a lot of voices uh, pleading for more liability. We hear the other sphere where it's about content, uh, free speech and so on, where we hear that we do not want to have more liability. 
So um, do you think that it was wise to put everything together in one instrument or could you imagine that during the legislative process, these two spheres would move a little bit apart, like be addressed in different chapters or whatever? And um, so this would be my question to you. And then we have a very, very quick last round with everyone just having 30 seconds to uh, give uh, Erica one a key takeaway. Erica, please. Uh, uh, thank you. I was thinking of this separation of discussion concerning marketplaces and other um, uh, social media um, yesterday, um, but I must admit we are glad that we have on the DSA on the table uh, uh, better, it's better than have, having nothing. Um, I think for the discussions it's very useful to have in mind the different uh, two uh, aspects. Um, concerning also liability. Well, the question before was, uh, I think there is uh, the question of, of, of damages for businesses if products are taken down, which are not really illegal. I think those are those which the consumers don't see because they are taken down, but it's a damage to the businesses. But I think we, we agree uh, with Ursula, of course, we don't want to have fraud, fraudful companies uh, uh, selling things uh, in the internet. Um, but uh, I think if we uh, work together, we find solutions uh, because I think it's not a, a black and white uh, in, in this issue. Um, for the takeaway, I would prefer not to uh, mention one thing um, and, and then maybe others think they are not, uh, um, uh, yeah, I, I, that I would don't take, take up uh, other issues. Um, I think it was really a very fruitful discussion uh, and, and concerning the details uh, will help us a lot uh, in preparing the meetings of the working parties. So I think uh, overall, many thanks to you uh, for this uh, conference. Well, thank you, Erica, and I'm sure we'll stay in touch, but let me now have a very last round and maybe let's, let's do it the other way around. Let's start with Semyon and then Ursula and then Rania and then Lucas comes last. Yeah, thank you for, for uh, the very good discussion. Um, uh, coming back to what I said at the beginning for us, is key is really harmonized rules um, across Europe uh, and uh, that we can uh, make sure that we are compliant. So um, legal certainty is really key. And uh, if I may pick up one just last example, which I wanted to answer earlier to Rania's first uh, statement when it comes to data access uh, and social media, uh, there, for example, uh, we totally understand the interest uh, to get access uh, for researchers, but the issue is that we need legal certainty uh, and a clear legal basis on what we uh, can refer data to third parties, as some of you might remember that we had quite bad experiences uh, in opening APIs uh, to, to third parties, to researchers in the past. So legal certainty is really key here. And that is what we are trying to accomplish over the next months and years of discussions. Thank you very much. So 30 seconds each. So Ursula, please, your, your main takeaways. Yes, thank you very much for a good discussion. Uh, I would like to maybe uh, mention things that we have not discussed. So it's not takeaways, but it's important points. And I'm sure it has been discussed during the conference. Enforcement and redress. I mean, I know the Commission really made an effort. Uh, a lot of the DSA is dedicated uh, to that issues, but we need to get that right. So I can only call on the legislators on Mrs. Umenberger to really look at that and how it interacts this uh, new uh, network in DSA with other uh, networks, for example, CPC on consumer protection uh, and the DMA where it really hurts. I think it has to be improved because it's only uh, after six years that in case of system systemic non-compliance, there could be behavior remedies, which are the only ones that will really make a difference. So need to improve there. And last not uh, least, profiling of consumers should be uh, something that consumers opt in on these platforms, not only for recommender systems, but more generally, that would be important. Thank you very much for this discussion. Thank you so much. Rania, please. Um, well, thank you again for this uh, really uh, very lively and, and um, informative discussion. And um, 
if I may, I, I want just two points and I'm going to um, agree with Semyon actually. Uh, legal clarity is absolutely important, not just for Facebook, but for the researchers uh, to how to do um, uh, and under which conditions. Um, so I absolutely uh, would like to see more of that for the data access, um, um, but at the risk of sounding like a broken record, I um, also would like to see uh, and I think the DMA is probably the one most likely to deliver this, uh, an opening up so that um, content moderation um, can be offered by third parties, uh, make it interoperable and put in the standards. So thank you very much. Thank you so much. And now Lucas, you have the last word. Thank you. I was just about to set the timer. So I because 30 seconds really is a short time. No, um, thank you very much. Um, Takeaway for me um, is definitely um, the, the idea of the um, open source um, content moderation. I think that would be very, very interesting um, to, to keep working on. And also the, the idea of um, private enforcement of the obligation set in, um, that will be very interesting to, to follow the discussion on. Um, thank you very much. Um, I hope the, the notification system that there will be a bit more um, more of a, 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 a yeah more attention to it. Um, I think thirty seconds. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you very much. So uh, I think our panelists deserve a big round of applause. So unfortunately, it is impossible to do so um, uh, in those virtual conferences, but I'm sure um, I can imagine the audience uh, applauding. Thank you so much. And uh, apologies to Nikolaus for running over for uh, almost 10 minutes. And uh, without further ado, I will hand over to Nikolaus and vanish from the screen. Thank you so much to everybody. Thank you so much. Uh, I will bring in the five minutes, uh, Christiane, because I will be very short. Um, I, I want to thank all of you, in particular you, Christiane, as my fellow co-host, all the speakers, all the panelists, all the chairs who made this a most truthful and most interesting presentation and debate and conference. I, I'm very grateful to this. And of course, I'm also very grateful to the whole organizational team, in particular, Nina, Catherine, Sebastian, Yannick, and Jakob. And one person who really needs to be uh, mentioned explicitly here, because she's the one mainly in charge of the fact that you didn't see too many technical glitches and technical issues. That's Tima Otuanvana, who was in the background. Here she is. I'm very glad to see you. Um, Tima, who was in charge of all the technical implications and implementations of the last two days. It was really a pleasure to have you all with us, uh, Tima, um, in the name of the whole team and as part of the whole team. Um, thank you in particular for everything which we did not see on the stage. Um, and I wish all of you um, a very nice afternoon and a very good evening. And I do hope that we stay in touch. Please uh, stay connected with us and have a good evening. And um, you don't need to travel home. So you are probably already at home. So enjoy the evening at home. Take care and all the best. Thank you.